Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be looking at part four of the bunch. Uh, and that, of course, is the Burroughs, Univac, NCR, CDC, and Honeywell. And today we're going to be looking at Univac. Stay tuned right after this. We call it Univac because of the broader name for the computer, not because it was a company. Univac means automatic, or excuse me, universal automatic computer. And it actually began as a research project and not as a company. It, the, the project began with a partnership between John Presper Eckert and John Mouchley at the University of Pennsylvania. They were wanting to build a computer that would allow people to be able to perform calculations, the computers at that time were human beings that sat down with slide rules and did complex calculations that were fraught with errors and had problems and was slow and tedious and had to be checked uh, in order to pass muster. It was, uh, and so they wanted to speed those up. And that's the reason why this thing whole all started. Eckert and Moshley invented the Electrical Numerical Integrator and Calculator, or ENIAC. Uh, about in 1943, they were working under a contract. They were getting money from the, uh, I believe, the Army. The Army was interested in being able to speed up their ballistics calculations, which is trajectory of artillery shells which was, by the way, the first problem that Babbage on his computer, this difference engine, was trying to solve as well. So it's kind of interesting. We've come kind of full circle and taken almost 80 years to get there. But uh, So they started in 1943 working on this machine, and they completed it in November of 1945. I believe it actually started doing work the next, the following year in 1946. ENIAC was, uh, they waited for quite a while to file a, a patent on this. It wasn't until 1947, a full two years after they completed the work for it. But ENIAC was a monster. It was huge. It had 40 nine foot tall cabinets. And in those cabinets, was the, you would find 17,500 ish vacuum tubes about 70,000 resistors, a little over 10,000 capacitors, 1,500 relays, and 6,000 manual switches, which is how it was programmed. If you see any video, of, and there are, is some, of uh, people doing programming, <laughs> they're just seeing up there twisted knobs. So that, that's, by the way, that's where that saying came from. I'm going to go twist some knobs. That's what that meant. So... Uh, it also uh, con uh, occupied about 1,800 square feet of uh, floor space, and it, it, w it consumed electricity like there was no tomorrow, 160 kilowatts. And it was said that when that machine was running, the lights in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, dimmed. So, yeah, don't doubt it. Don't doubt it. One of its, uh, one of its more colorful assets is that the ENIAC had no memory at all. Uh, in fact, uh, it wasn't until 1953 that it got any. Burroughs came in and added core memory to the ENIAC uh, in order for it to continue on and doing more modern types of calculations. So, yeah, it took a while to get there. What did they use for memory in the meantime? Punch cards, <laughs> which had to be probably the slowest way to get stuff in and out of the computer. But that's what they used. Around 1946 or so, there was a patent dispute with the University of Pennsylvania. I understand this. I had I ran into the same thing with Plato. So I kind of get this. Um, yeah, you get into some sticky wickets if you're, especially if you're receiving money from the university on who actually owns your research. So uh, Eckert and Mouchley were forced to pretty much leave the university in order to continue working on their design. And so they formed their own company called the Eckert Mouchley Computer Corporation, or EMCC, in 1946. They worked on uh, their first. Uh, project as EMCC was this one. This is BENIAC. BENIAC was an attempt to build the first commercially viable computer, and it wasn't successful. They they sold a couple of them, and I don't think they were ever used because they just didn't work that well. So yeah, it was not a success. <laughs> 
But they did have success and they did build up their business. Uh, they were able to build their headquarters and uh, this is Remington, uh, I think this is Remington Rand's headquarters in Rowington, uh, Connecticut at the time. But when the EMCC chairman, his name was Henry Strauss, Mouchley and Eckert weren't interested in the business side. They were interested in the research side, so they didn't get involved with a day-to-day -day on the business side. So Henry Strauss ran the company. Well, he suddenly died in 1950, and when that happened, Mouchley and Eckert sold the company to Remington Rand. Uh, it was also, if you if you watch the, the video on Control Data, it was also about that same time that Remington Rand also purchased ERA, which was the forerunner to Control Data Corporation up in Minnesota. So, yeah, same guys. So shown here is, this is, called, this is the Rockledge Estate. And it served as the headquarters for Remington Rand from 1943 until I think 1964 or so. Hmm, the Univac was born. Uh, this is the Univac 1. It was developed in 1951 and it was viable until I think four years. It was four years that uh, they stayed on this architecture or this machine design. It's claimed it was famous. This machine was pretty famous. It sat in the bottom of a of the uh, studios of CBS, I think, in New York City. And they, it was the, CBS had the presidential election coverage that year, and so um, they, they, CBS had two uh, predictions for the result outcome of the presidential race. The Gallup poll showed it would be close. It would be a very tight race, and but Eisenhower would win. The Univac predicted a landslide for Eisenhower over a 10 to 1 margin over whoever his, his, uh, his, his uh, competitor was for the presidential race. CBS refused to run the, uh, the results from the Univac because they didn't trust it. And that's pretty typical. I mean, that's pretty typical in this early age. If the computer said something, everybody's like, yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, sure. And, uh, how did they come up with that answer? Uh, so, yeah, they just didn't trust it and they didn't believe it, so they didn't run with it. However, the next morning they found out that the Remington was right, the Gallup poll was wrong. And after that, the uh, network started using computers to do the presidential race predictions, and they still do today. 1955, Remington Rand uh, merged with Sperry Corporation to become Sperry Rand uh, later, and that was during this time frame that uh, the, 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 the phrase IBM and the seven doors came about. Um, and, uh, of course, RCA and GE were still in the business at that time. They hadn't sold off yet. So, yeah. And uh, Univac uh, systems be, continued to evolve, become bigger and more powerful, as, and also started to use, uh, moved away from uh, tube memory and tube uh, CPUs to uh, solid state or transistor based. This computer is the Univac LARC or L-A-R-C, LARC. It was designed specifically for the Livermore Advanced Research, Research uh, Center. And this was the computer that was designed specifically by Edward Teller. Edward Teller was the head of Livermore uh, Nuclear Programs, the program research, and they were doing hydrodynamic calculations, which are quite complex. They were doing it manually, and it was taking them a long time to figure it out, and they needed a way to be able to predict, you know, accurately what would happen if I had this yield and I got what would the result be, and they, they didn't know a lot of times. So um, Edward Teller gave the specifications to Remington Ram on what he wanted, and they built the machine. This was one of the first, it's not the first, but it was one of the first supercomputers uh, that was put into use in order to do scientific calculations. In 1976, uh, Remington, uh, or Sperry at this time, came out with the Univac 1108, and this was the first machine that had multiple CPUs in it. So it was able to share the workload between multiple CPUs and be able to do multiprocessing. Also, in about uh, 10 years later, uh, Burroughs and... Uh, Sperry merged to form Unisys. And the machine on top was Burroughs' A series, and the one on the bottom was the uh, Univac uh, OS 2200, I believe. 
the uh, that machine, uh, the OS has gone. OS twenty two hundred has gone through a number of modifications to become what it is today. The one on top was Burroughs at the time, which is kind of weird that they they decided to to merge with another company. Had just completed the merger internally. The they had two divisions. They had the small system and the large system division. The large system division had three different architectures. They had a small uh, computer design a medium computer design, and a large computer design. None of them were code compatible. So I, the, uh, the large system wanted to build a machine that ran applications across the entire space from the small system architecture all the way up to the largest one. So they designed the A-series, and that became the corporate standard. So just as they had finished this, they decided to merge with Sperry in here, and they got another problem, which is now they got to figure out how we're going to manage these two computer architectures. So, and that was, as you can imagine, painful. We had a after the merger, they had a. Well, the first thing that happened was Sperry took a poison pill, and they didn't want to be bought out by Burroughs, and Burroughs had to cough up quite a bit of money in order to buy them. I don't remember what the final figure was, but I do know that after that, they didn't really have enough money left to do any operations or any research. So, yeah, so they basically were bleeding to death because they had 131,000 employees that they didn't need. And so they pared down almost to 40,000, just slightly under 40,000 employees in a very short span of time. And it was chaotic at best. I remember going to work and it was like, oh, who's gone now? It was it was like one week we would have 30 people when we started and they, they, they people just started poop, poop. It was like they poofed. And, uh, and the secretary and I were the only ones left. They were trying to get me to move to Chicago, but I wasn't interested in that. So I decided before they got me, they didn't need to keep the building open for two people. So before they got me, I decided to move off to AT&T. So in 1993, Unisys introduced the first CMOS-based machine. Now that is, uh, that is a machine that is called Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. It is a, a type of uh, semiconductor that allows you to imprint designs on the chip. So, yeah, so anyway, uh, the 2200 500 was the first one to do that uh, in 1993. In 2006, uh, they introduced this machine. This is the ES7000-1. This one was designed to run uh, Windows and Linux applications. I think it also ran Solaris uh, in, a, in, in the data center. So that, this allowed customers to pick the operating system and then run it, whatever applications they needed to run. And then they went a step forward. Unisys decided to take that architecture on further, and they brought their operating systems onto the Intel platform, and they developed this machine called the Clear Path Forward, which allowed uh, customers to run applications from the OS 2200 side or the Burroughs MCP side, from Linux or from Solaris or from Windows even. And they allowed those applications to run side by side. Uh, and that they still have architectures like that today. Uh, I think they're up in there. The machines don't look anything like that, but they, uh, yeah, they're quite a bit smaller than that actually now. They also have moved out of the proprietary hardware onto more common commodity hardware. So today you can run your the clear path forward on anybody's Intel-based machines. So in 75 years, the industry came a pretty long way. I mean, they saw changes from computers with no memory that were programmed with hardwire switches to the first programming languages, assembler, then programming languages, to scientific computers or supercomputers, and then finally to multiple processors, to CMOS and to being able to be able to be ubiquitous and run multiple operating systems at the same time. Quite a change from then to now. Um, Unisys is still in business and they develop applications. They were actually well positioned for the pandemic because they already were in the digital work, uh, the digital workforce space. They had solutions in there almost 10 years ahead of time. Uh, they also do cloud and infrastructure. They do enterprise computing, of course. And 
they've always done business computing or the business side where you're doing process management. Uh, they also were well well suited for cybersecurity. In fact, uh, when cybersecurity be- started to become a thing, it's always been a thing, but when it became a, a necessary thing, uh, Unisys was one of the first companies that were already positioned with software solutions to be able to op- make offerings in that space. Um, so, uh, given what, where we've been with these two, I think you have to look at a couple of things. First, why was it, why were these companies that have been around for so long uh, so successful? How, what was their secret to surviving that many years? Now, Burroughs actually has an older history. They go way, way, way back, just like NCR does. So, I mean, 75 years in the, in the computer business, how, well, how, how could they survive? I mean, there's been so many kind of shakeouts along the way. A lot of computer companies no longer exist. I think the key was adaptability and the fact that they kind of read the industry about five to ten years ahead of time. They knew where it was going, and they had planned where they wanted to be at the right time. That takes some skill. Uh, That takes some skill to be able to do that. Um, Companies that don't do that usually end up gone. Usually, like you saw CDC, they... They knew what they wanted for a business model, but unfortunately, they made a critical mistake. And the critical mistake cost them their business that they, because they could never recover from it. So, yeah, there was a lot of, different, lot of ways that it happened. Uh, there are four companies that have survived uh, the early days of computing, and, and two of them exist as one. <laughs> and uh, uh, the other two are still around. So... Yeah, NCR and IBM, of course, uh, still exist. So there's four still remaining. What will happen in the next 75 years? Well, clearly one thing won't be there is currently we're in an era of stagnation because it's being artificially uh, held back by companies that have the desire for you to continue to buying their products. They, they innovate just enough. Well, I've talked about this before. They've, they innovate just enough to keep you interested, but they don't have the innovations that those companies had uh, year over year. So, I mean, if you look at the broader thing, what is that? What is uh, what has Microsoft really done in the last thirty years? That's new. Uh, in fact, they've been consistently late on any new technology. They've been blindsided several times by technology changes because they're just they don't care. They just they're grinding out. Uh, money uh, coming out of their machine. Now, not to pick on just them. I mean, IBM same way. IBM's still making their mainframes. Why? In, in this in this uh, day and age, when you could just migrate that code onto Intel and be done with your mainframe based machines. Uh, same thing with uh, you know where we are at in the cloud space, where we have server architecture architectures based on Windows and Linux today. Uh, cell phones, uh, they are dominated by two operating systems. They're not likely to change uh, unless the company themselves wants to change for some reason. So, yeah, I mean, part of it is competition, yeah. Part of it is the fact that you have people that are willing to take a risk. Now, today, uh, I, don't think, I don't think we have the same passion for risk because the cost of failure is a lot higher than it used to be. So, yeah, yeah. You lose, if you fail today in a business venture, you're talking millions and millions of dollars going down the drain, not hundreds of thousands. So, it makes a big difference. It makes a big difference for some reason. <laughs> anyway, that's all I had for today. I'm gonna hop off my soapbox. I hope to see you all again real soon. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and join us on the channel. Try to do something a little bit different every once in a while. Doesn't always catch a lot of people's attention, but that's okay. Uh, I do pretty much what I like to do, but I also like to do videos on what you want me to do too. So let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next. Hope to see you again. Bye for now.